demon-induced movement um, results in the two effects that I'm concerned about. One is uh, degraded resolution in an untilted specimen. You don't get the signal of the resolution that you ought to get. <coughs> Second one is uh, loss of resolution in the direction for particular tilt axis or tilted specimens above and beyond what I was talking about for untilted axis. And the third one that I'm not personally um, you know, uh, don't have much uh, investment in, but I know the field suffers a lot from, is movement of gold particle fiducials in samples that are being used for uh, cryo-EM tomography. So they move around and therefore images in a data set are not commensurate with one another because things have moved around. So being induced movement is a major limiting effect. I want to emphasize before I get into my slides, it's not an effect that um, uh, makes it uh, you know, impossible to continue to do the work that you're all aiming to do. But it makes it tedious and time consuming and frustrating and takes a long, a long, long time to complete the project. So if we could um, mitigate or, or, or somehow uh, decrease the how much increase movement there is, all of our work would proceed much more rapidly uh, in, in many ways uh, better than currently. So I have a few slides to illustrate the induced movement. I'll try to go through them as quickly as possible and then talk about our largely failed attempts so far to do something about it. But, um, the, this is an image uh, given to us by Open Pronk. In fact, he gave us a, a few hundred such images, and they all show the same thing. A cryo-EM image of the ribosomes and prepared on continuous carbon film. Uh, uh, Richard Paul in my lab, uh, now with Ethan Dallas, because the postdoc that even did this work, unfortunately he hasn't published it. Um, he, he took um, uh, little areas of, of the specimen, um, computed their uh, component patterns, and classified the cone patterns. Instead of classifying the particles, he classified the cone patterns. And then after he had different classes, he computed class averages. Some looked quite nice. Some also looked quite nice, but in fact would have different D factors from that one. Others obviously were drifting in one direction, and, and yet others drifting in a slightly different direction. He asked, where are those, the particles making up those classes? Where are they located? <coughs> and as you see, they're color-coded. They, they occur in different zones of the same micrograph. And this is true of every image uh, that we're going to look at. And um, the pattern of distribution of these is random from one micrograph to the next. So it's not stage drift <coughs> or other things. It could be charging and deflection of the image, but there's lots of reasons why I feel that that charging is the wrong explanation. And I'll tell you what I think the correct explanation is, but I first want to show you some more data. Uh, one, one of the things I wanted to show you is pretty ancient data that uh, went back to one of my earlier sabbatical visits in Cambridge with Richard Henderson. And um, this table, shows um, the measurement that was made of um, how much signal, you know, the, what, what fraction of the signal um, is observed in an image relative to what you know the signal should be because you measured the diffraction intensity in an electron diffraction pattern. So you take a sample of vermiculite, which is a mica-like material, a thin sheet, uh, monolayer crystals of paraffin and glucose embedded purple membrane. Take these and you measure their absolute intensities in the electron diffraction pattern. I can explain how this is done, but I don't have the time right now. Uh, measure the electron diffraction intensity. Then you record an image and measure um, what is the amplitude of the Fourier transform of the image. And it's invariably a lot less than it is in the electron diffraction pattern. Um, for the four angstrom from spacing of vermiculite, it's roughly a quarter of what it should be. I think in a modern microscope, it might be as high as a half. But uh, 
point out that vermiculite is a really good insulator, at least as good an insulator as any biological specimen. So if something is going to charge, <coughs> really charge. Paraffin is typically only 5%, not 25% uh, of the sun range. And in fact, the range goes to zero. You know, most of them, you don't see any signal. Um, and in ones where you see the spots, they're uh, about 2 to 10%, something like that. Purple membrane, similar uh, values. Don't have a, a range of them. But um, uh, However, the ratio of the signal that you actually get compared to what should be there from the electron diffraction pattern oh, depends steeply on the resolution. There's a very big B factor, you know, thermal disorder factor, uh, it's not thermal, a very big uh, uh, disorder factor in the image relative to what there is in the sample itself. But the electron diffraction pattern measures what's in the sample. And these numbers are, are from the image. So you might say, well, that was on a 1985 microscope. It wasn't helium temperature stage and all sorts of things. So here's some data from uh, Yoshi's lab, now uh, nine years old, from purple membrane. And the same, this is purple membrane. And, it, and the, uh, this is plotting the log of the intensity um, from the image to that from the diffraction pattern. And it falls off. You, know, you could fit that with a straight line if you wanted to. There are a few cases that are a little bit higher. The x's should be ignored, as explained in the paper. Um, and when you get out to uh, three or four angstrom in resolution, uh, if you calculate the amplitude rather than the log of the intensity ratio, uh, again, it's a, a, on average 10%, uh, sometimes less, occasionally a little bit better. So we, Richard Henderson and I, attribute this to beam-induced motion, trying to use neutral language to not imply whether it's motion of the sample or motion of the image, whether it's due to charging or other causes. Um, but this, this phenomenon has not improved in the uh, you know, 20, 25 years uh, since that paper was published. Then you saw earlier at this meeting this same figure from uh, uh, Yobu and, and Fukuyoshi's lab. But what happens when you tilt the sample? In this case, the sample is tilted at 45 degrees. If you tilted it at 60, it would look even worse. So as you heard, this is a good one. You see spots not only parallel to the tilt axis, but some spots perpendicular to it. But it's obvious it's not really as good perpendicular as it is parallel. And it gets worse as you tilt the higher angle. This phenomenon seems to happen only for radiation sensitive specimens. Um, and if you tilt a sample of graphite, and who was it that showed it in their talk, you know, it's equally good in all directions. You see the three and a half extra fringes with equal amplitude in all directions, even at 70 degrees. Tilt, this happened with the JOL acceptance test on our uh, 3100. So, um, uh, the, um, with, without, uh, without at this time, you know, in, the, in the short talk, trying to defend my opinion, not true, um, uh, I, I think the most likely explanation for what's going on is that radiation damage generates stress in our radiation sensitive specimens that the specimen responds to the stress by moving um, and trying to relieve the stress. And a thin foil will well undergo all kinds of buckling and bending. In fact, if you look at small molecule organic crystals, like Bailey, you see what are called bend contours. And for the doses far lower than what cause fading in the diffraction pattern, you see these bend contours swimming around uh, over that area of the crystal. Undeniably, organic crystals uh, bend and buckle in the electron beam at doses small compared to what causes fading of the diffraction pattern. And I believe that that motion is likely to be a big, big part of the phenomena I've been discussing. Um, it's quite possible that a double carbon sandwich, or possibly using just the carbon film twice as thick as you would normally use, 
will reduce the amount of, of that button. What do you say this movement is always perpendicular to the tilt axis? Ah, so, so if um, you have a thin foil that uh, due to stress or due to charging, charging may be causing the stress for all I know. But, but, um, but if, if it's doing this and it's not tilted, um, it fluctuates in focus by plus or minus 100 angstroms, you wouldn't know it. But if it now is doing exactly the same motion as before, then there's a horizontal component always perpendicular to the tilt axis. Um, so, um, the, um, this, this systematic motion perpendicular to the tilt axis um, uh, makes life miserable if you're trying to do uh, crystallography with, with uh, two-dimensional two crystals. It's not impossible. Beautiful structure's been determined. Anytime somebody has a structure that diffracts to three or, or four angle resolution, and you are committed enough, you will get your structure at that resolution. You just have to work really hard, and you should. Um, so it's worth the effort if you do have well diffracting to the crystals. But um, you have to have a positive attitude uh, and uh, uh, commitment uh, to, uh, to get there. And unfortunately, so many two-dimensional crystal projects have diffracted quite well. It, it, uh, the thin crystals diffract quite well untilted. But the work was stopped by the investigator at something like six to eight angstrom resolution in the 3D reconstruction. Could have gone higher, but the work is, is, is quite, uh, quite uh, takes a lot of effort. All right, so um, this slide, the, the title says that this movement is likely, it doesn't say it's proven to be, but it's likely to be caused by, uh, by stress or pressure. And the reason I say that is that in 1986, McBride and colleagues um, had a paper in science, the purpose of which was to, to study chemical reactions that occur in the solid state of a crystal material. And that was a photolysis initiated reaction. And um, uh, uh, as, as part of their study of the chemical reactions between adjacent molecules in the crystal, uh, they measured that there was a buildup of pressure in the crystal as a function of how much photolysis had occurred, the pressure increased. Um, turns out this uh, is almost a way to make diamond because the measured pressure rose to half the value that, that will convert graphite to diamond after only 5% of the molecules have been damaged. And you can read the paper, you don't have to believe me. Um, the um, explanation for why the pressure would rise is that the products of radiolysis um, no longer fit into the cavity that the parent molecules fit into. Really simple example, you have a protein, uh, you break the peptide bond between a nitrogen and a carbon, Two atoms that were one and a half angstroms apart now become a van der Waals distance, three and a half angstroms apart. And it's in a well-packed material, a solid state, uh, frozen if you want, etc. There's going to be resistance to that motion. And that pressure will build up. Stress will be generated. <coughs> um, and that stress will remain frustrated until a sample finds a way to bend and buckle and, and, and relax that stress as much as it can. Now, from one event, that won't cause a huge structural change, for example, but then there will be thousands of, of these events. And we will have them occurring in fluctuating places, um, and the resultant stress can be pretty large, uh, and its direction, the direction of the resultant stress uh, will fluctuate. Um, Bob? Yes. How long does it take for that stress to actually dissipate through the crystal and cause macroscopic effects? I don't know. Um, and I am going to pick up on that point in, in one of my latter slides. Um, uh, so I won't, won't say more just now. But, um, so um, here is a, an example of some of the not yet published work that 
Henderson and I did three years <coughs> ago. Um, this is a spot scan image taken on the F30 at nitrogen temperature, uh, recorded on photographic film using a GATAM uh, cold stage. <coughs> um, a um, highly coherent illumination conditions. You can see the focused spot is um, uh, has strong free, uh, strong Fresnel ripples in it. Um, uh, this was one of the better images that we reported. Spot scan image reported on film. The um, uh, the amplitude was about 20% of what it should be theoretically. So remember, the best is normally 10. Um, Dieter has recorded an image that was 35% of, of what it should be. Yeah, Brink once. Yeah, Brink has recorded and published once 40% of what it should be. Um, uh, you can't do science under those. Uh, you can can do uh, uh, luck. You can publish luck, but you can't publish science at that frequency. All right. The important thing is it's physically possible. If it can happen once or three times, or five times, in principle, it could happen always. And our challenge is to find out you know, what went right under those that make it happen almost all the time. But it's worth the pursuit because we know it's physically possible. We're not just wishing, hopefully, that it will happen. <coughs> um, okay, so in this one, you know, the, the, the uh, there are three pairs of spots all at around four inches from resolution, and uh, in this in this series of experiments, occasionally the spots at two and a half inches from resolution, and then I showed one yesterday where they went beyond two inches from resolution, but uh, once. Uh, so here is an experiment, and I'm going to show that movie in, in just a second, but I say a few words about it. Um, done with the Medipix detector, which I think is uh, the best commercially available detector in terms of MTF and PQE. Um, uh, <coughs> the, it's quite noise free. The single electron events do have a pulse height distribution, but it's much narrower than, than uh, one in the example shown previously. Um, this image was taken with um, uh, 5 times 10 minus 3 electrons per square angstrom. And um, it, I think the field of view is, uh, yeah, the field of view is about 1,000 angstroms. So um, there were 5,000 electrons in this picture. If you don't believe me, start coming. I'll leave it up until you can. Um, so, Take the Fourier transform of one such frame, you don't see any spots at all. But it, there are uh, uh, there are 160, if I can find it. Um, oh, it's showing on my screen, but not on me. Um, I wonder if I can play it again. It isn't that important. Stop. Play it again. So there's 160 of them. Um, and you calculate the power spectra of each of them, and you add up these power spectra incoherently, and then you get the thing on the on the left. And with the eye of faith, you can see a spot there and one there, and I can't see the one down here. But when you, uh, the signal to noise in the spots is high enough that if you threshold it and stretch it, you see them very, very clearly. Um, and the reason this experiment had to be considered a failure is that the ratio of the observed diffraction amplitude to that of the electron diffraction was no better than um, if, if we had done this heroic experiment. So as Richard likes to put it, 
If you take an image with one electron, there will be no beam induced motion during that image. And if you could add them all up uh, and, and realign them and unbend them, uh, then there would be no beam induced motion. But that's not possible. Uh, he was absolutely sure with this exposure, it would still be fine, but it wasn't. The sample is jiggling and moving and bending and warping. Um, and the net result is if you took all of these, you know, and added the images without any, any Yeah? Um, just a question. Is it now uh, so that you have to not consider any shift in between? And if so, when you calculate you cross the, yeah, the, uh, uh, you could not cross correlate with this. Yeah, that is a yeah, yeah. But we wanted to see, is there a point at which we no longer see beam induced motion? And the answer is not at this point. Is this even just motion or could this just be a specimen drift? Uh, so if it were a drift, then it would be bad in one direction. It's equally bad in all directions. So it is a kind of drift, but it's a stochastic or ergodic one. Uh, I would call it a, a random jitter in chaotic motion. So Dieter has published a, a paper a couple of years ago. I'm not going to show that data now just because of limitation of time, in which he could actually see the random jitter. Uh, and the paraffin crystal jittered relative to the carbon film. That one blew our minds. But that result mean, cannot be explained by charging. It would have to change both the same in concert. So there is clearly a physical motion that cannot be explained by charging. Is there another question? Why not by charging? Why does the, the carbon also move, but not nearly as much as the uh, air? Um, so this, I'm almost finished. Um, the, um, this is my opinion about an experiment that should be supported. Uh, somebody with money should uh, carry out this experiment. And it's not going to be cheap. Uh, so I would propose to combine the extreme dose fractionation of the kind you just saw uh, with ultra-fast exposure time. So this comes to Ankar's question. That, um, so I believe I'm correct. Uh, Nigel Browning, who will talk about dynamic PEM on Thursday evening, uh, would, would be able to tell me whether I'm right or, or not. Uh, but I believe I'm correct. That, one can maintain high beam quality for pulses that are as short as a nanosecond. Um, well, uh, it, this is a true statement. You, you can maintain beam quality uh, for pulses as short as one nanosecond if the number of electrons is small enough. But I don't know the physics of, of the Birch effect and, and DTM well enough to, to know um, whether the beam quality remains high if there are 10 to the 6 electrons in each image. 10 to the 6 electrons would allow you to align successive images, um, apropos uh, Andreas's question. And I think 10 to the 6 is a small number compared to what people in the field are aiming for, so I think the beam quality would be good. So I think this is a doable experiment. It's something that could be done uh, at Livermore almost right away, I think. Now, if one does such an experiment, there will be stochastic elastic deformation. As every bond is broken, it will push its neighbors, and they will push their neighbors, and so forth. Um, and that, that pushing will move, propagate with the speed of sound. That's what sound is in a solid, propagation of sound. It's one atom pushing against another. So that's uh, about a kilometer per second, uh, a thousand meters per second. Thus, easy to compute, 1,000 nanometers per nanosecond. And we can't un outrun that motion. But the amplitude of the motion will dissipate as you get away from the point defect, uh, become smaller and smaller, and won't be very big to begin with, uh, although it would be annoying a little bit. But, um, but physically, I don't see outrunning that. On the other hand, um, the sample will then relax as with, with the speed of, of sound. Uh, but it, it will still be frustrated. It will say, I want to do more than this. 
And so it will start to bend and, and buckle. And bending motions are the softest ones to leave stress. And then you have to move massive amounts of matter, not just atoms that are adjacent neighbors. That will be slower. I have no idea whether it's slow relative to a nanosecond. And I don't know how anybody could calculate it, because it depends on the boundary conditions of how the sample is attached to the support film or to the bars. Uh, <coughs> involves a lot of things that we don't, or I personally don't know anything about. But, so it remains to be determined whether nanosecond exposures would be fast enough to outrun what I call plastic deformations. Um, you know, at least uh, something that's akin to plastic uh, involving, uh, well, certainly the flow of nanogold gold to neutral particles, that's a plastic deformation. It's not an elastic one. The bending of thin samples in electron crystallography, you know, it's going to take much longer time scale than the propagation of the speed of sound. Um, now, between successive pulses, none of which is enough dose to, to extract useful data, um, uh, these deformations will, will catch up with the exposure, and they'll be completed before the next pulse hits. So each such frame would have to be on depth and aligned in the data sum coherently. Uh, this is a desperate uh, hope, but desperate times require desperate measures, and I think we've exhausted uh, at least all of, all of the less desperate things I can think of. Question? Uh, and so uh, this slide ends with, with a quotation that is uh, part of my life philosophy. <laughs> Nothing happens unless first agreement. So this is a dream, uh, but unless you dream, you know, nothing's going to happen, and we have to do something. The fact that it's tough is an argument for doing nothing. All right. Um, thank all of my colleagues who um, participated in different aspects of what I've gone over. Uh, Dieter and, and Ken, Mr. Hall, postdoc I mentioned, Hong Wei Wang. Um, helped pursue some of the experiments that I was doing together with Richard Henderson when I came back, but we eventually abandoned them and even uh, was involved. And uh, MRC Richard Henderson, Wasi Faruqi, who's the detector guy, and Greg McMullen, who is uh, a lot of uh, computer support for the development. Chris Gilpin helped with the experiments that I actually didn't describe that, that, that Peter did. I described them verbally, but I didn't show the slide. 